Now we've made a really good start with the board and the pawn and it's time to make the bishop. This is the one we're going to make and once you know the method it'll take you less than 10 minutes. I want to show you the finished one before we make it just to talk about the benefits of a subdivision surface model compared to a polygon or hard surface model. And the difference is all about the flow of polygons over a shape. If I tab to edit mode to take a look you can see without me even telling you anything about it that this model feels like it has a fairly natural flow. If we zoom in a little to the head you can see that there are rows or we call them rings of polygons following the natural shapes around the edges. And it's these constructs that define a subdivision surface model. You probably already know that we like to use quads and obviously this mesh is made entirely from quads uh, but you may not know about the importance of four spoked poles. I call them natural poles. I'm not sure if that's the correct term. They're simply vertices with four edges coming out of them and they are the absolute best way to get light to react to your surfaces properly whenever there's curvature. If you look back through any of my other videos you'll see that I always try to create these areas of curvature between shapes with natural poles and I place loops in between them which I turn red which can be used to control the curvature. I put one here and if I'm in edge select mode and I alt click it to select the whole thing I can then just press GG to change the tightness of the curvature between the two areas it's separating. The important thing is that it's only surrounded by natural or four spoked poles. You can get away with any kind of geometry inside an area and it can be full of poles and even triangles although I do always avoid n-gons. The important point is that our edges are surrounded by vertices with four spoked poles and the main modeling tool in Blender to achieve this is the inset tool. It's the most misunderstood operation in modeling. It's assumed to be an alternative to an extrusion but it's only very vaguely related to extrusions. Its main job is to redirect flow around edges and if we use them to do just that when cutting bits out of objects like the notch we'll find that our models deform really well under fairly extreme deformation. Now this video is definitely a little bit more advanced but hopefully you'll see that advanced just means better. It doesn't really mean more difficult. I can stop messing around with this now. Let's make it. As with the pawn I've found an image of a bishop I vaguely want to follow and the process of adding it is exactly the same as it was for the pawn so I'll very quickly add it by switching to the front view by pressing 1 on the number pad. Press shift now to bring up the add menu and select image reference. I'll find my reference image and as before it appears centered in the 3D view slightly bigger than the default cube. And again I'll change a few parameters in the object data section to make it useful to work with. So I'll change the Y offset to 0 so that it sits on the axis. Change the depth to front so it's always in front of everything else. Change the opacity to 0.5 so we can see through it while we work and click the only axis align checkbox so it only appears in the front view where we'll do our extruding. Press F2 and rename it to something like Bishop Reference. Now I just want to move the reference around a little bit so that it's centered and sitting on the baseline. This looks good so I'll deselect the visibility toggle in the outliner so we can't accidentally move it or select it while we're working. If you can't see these small arrows for the visibility of an object just go to the little funnel icon which is a drop down menu and make its icon blue. This adds the visibility toggle to everything in the outliner. I'll just delete the default cube and show you what most people do and why it's so wrong. As with the pawn you'll see people add a mesh circle and extrude the body up following the reference. And here I'm just going to quickly extrude this one up. I'm not going to be very careful. It's just a demonstration until they get to the top where it's sealed off normally by doing something like scaling the vertices to zero. Again a sphere is normally added and scaled up to be what we call a prolate spheroid. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't really matter about the name of that. And uh, everything is bad so far but the real crime happens next. Another object is added like a scaled cube and it's uh, positioned where the cut goes. Some type of boolean operation is then performed to cut this shape out of the sphere. It doesn't matter what you try to do next, you've already broken this shape beyond reasonable repair. There are triangles, n-gons, badly placed poles all over the place. And the process of fixing it by moving and merging points will get you nowhere near a usable geometry. As with the pawn, starting from the bottom and working up is leaving the geometry count or the weight of the mesh to guesswork. And we don't want to do that, so we'll start at the top and model down. We can certainly delete all this, it's rubbish. We can start with a cube again which we're going to use to make a quad sphere for that head and the bishop. Press shift and A to bring up the add menu and select mesh cube. Now any subdivision level will work but 3 is always a good place to start. So add a subdivision surface modifier with a level of 3 by pressing control on 3 in the 3D view and immediately apply the subdivision surface modifier by hovering over it and pressing control A in the modifier panel. Then tab into edit mode 
press Shift, Alt, and S, and drag the mouse to the right until it's a sphere. And that's just called the two sphere operation. And be aware that we've used the subdivision surface modifier as a modeling tool here, not as a way of controlling our curvature. We'll use another subdivision surface modifier later, which controls that. This one was purely a modeling operation. Now, in the front view, in an object mode, move it up and scale it roughly into position. Now that's all I'm gonna use the reference image for for now, so I'm gonna turn off its visibility in the outliner by clicking the little eye icon next to its name. Press F2 and rename it to Bishop. Now tap back into object mode and add our final subdivision surface modifier to this object. This is the one that controls our final curvature and resolution. Now it's gonna be useful to have a copy of this Bishop mesh, and we'll see why soon, but for now just press Shift and D to duplicate it, and press F2 to rename this Bishop Target. We won't use it yet, so turn off its visibility in the outliner and reselect our Bishop mesh. Press 3 on the number line of your keyboard to change to Face Select mode. And now we can have a look at the power of the inset operation. Now we need to be able to select faces on all sides of our object for the next part, so I'll switch to wireframe mode and click anywhere to deselect everything. And now we need to drag a box around some faces at the middle of the mesh. It doesn't matter how far down you select, this will define the deepness of the cut. Now, press I to inset these faces and, and move the mouse just a little way, just to activate the inset operation. Don't worry about placing the inset anywhere in particular, as we're going to specify the exact position in the dialog box down here. Now we need to have boundary, offset even, and offset relative checked. And in the thickness field, type 0.5 and hit enter. Now press X and select delete faces, and we can take a look at what we've done. We've created a new floor all around the edges of where we want our cut to be. And this is what the inset tool is for changing the direction of flow around a subdivision surface mesh. So you'll see now that if I press Ctrl and R to insert a loop on our mesh, that there's now this discrete area which has its own direction and it's connected as quads to the rest of the mesh. Now our shape has a cut, but it's not yet very, uh, well, bishopy. Tab back to object mode and turn the visibility of the bishop target shape mesh back on and maybe turn the bishop off while we're working on it. We're going to make the overall shape of our bishop using this mesh. Tab into edit mode and make sure that you're in the front view. Now click anywhere to deselect everything, and then click just above the center vertex at the top of the mesh to select it. And at the top of the 3D view is this little circle, which turns on something called proportional editing. Next to the circle is a drop-down menu for the way proportional editing is handled. These are all really useful and worth playing with on any heavily subdivided mesh, but the one I'm going to use here is Sharp. Now press G to grab this vertex and press Z to constrain the movement to the Z axis. You'll notice a circle around the point which shows the circle of influence of the proportional editing tool. Scrolling the mouse wheel will now change the size of this circle, changing how much of the mesh is affected when we move our point up and down. This is more than good enough, so let's tab back to object mode. We don't need to see this object anymore, and in fact, it'll just get in the way. Let's turn the visibility of the bishop mesh back on and select it. Now, if you go to the modifier panel, either by pressing D if you watch the setting up video, or just over here on the panel with the blue wrench and in this drop down menu, add a shrink wrap modifier to our bishop. Now the shrink wrap modifier works just like the cast modifier, but you can use it with more complex shapes. Now in the shrink wrap modifier properties, we want to change the wrap method to project. By default, the negative checkbox here is unticked, so click it so that our points can move both inwards and outwards towards the target shape. The most important thing to select in this properties box is the target, and you can just click on the blank box to see a list of objects you can use. We only have one of the mesh, which is the bishop target shape. So select that one, and you'll see that our mesh becomes the same shape. And finally, click the on cage button at the top of the modifier so we can see its effect while we work. Make sure you're in the front view. Now press R to rotate, and we can angle our cut while still keeping the same underlying shape. Now this looks good, but you can see that the edges of our cutout curl in a little, and that's just not what we want. Accidental features like this can be just what you want, but I think if you can't fix something, you should. And it's a good opportunity to learn about another one of our loop tools. We'll straighten these up with the flatten tool. First of all, select two opposing corner vertices inside the cut by clicking one of them and then shift clicking the other one. Now we need to move the 3D cursor between our two points, and we can do that by pressing shift and S and selecting cursor to select it. It just moves it here in between them. Now we want to select all the other vertices between these two along the curve. There are lots of ways to select vertices, but I usually use control and click over short distances to quickly select them all. And from the loop tools in the edit tab of the end panel, select flatten, which flattens them down. Now change the transform pivot to 3D cursor. We can also rotate them if we want by pressing R in the front view if you want to change anything else about the angle of the cut. 
That looks good, so I'll now go on and repeat this process for the other side of the cut. Select the two opposing corner vertices, move the 3D cursor between them. Now we want to select all the other vertices between these two along the curve. Press flatten and rotate a little in the front view if you want. Now before we fill in the cut, we can take advantage of the continued influence of the shrink wrap modifier to make our hole in the bottom while still keeping it this kind of spherical shape. We we'll use that hole later to extrude out the body. It's the same process we used for the pawn. In the front view, click anywhere to deselect everything, then click just below the bottom of the mesh and it will choose the nearest vertex to the very bottom of the mesh. Now we can orbit round and, and press Ctrl and plus to expand the selection. Hit X and choose vertices to leave this square hole in the bottom. As I think I've mentioned before, we always use median point when extruding and scaling loops, so change to that. Now just Alt click on this loop. Press E and then S to scale this loop down a little way. It'll do its best to keep our target shape and it'll do a good job. Hit the circle button in loop tools and then change the influence over here to 50% in the temporaries property box. Press E and then S again and scale it down. Again, hit circle but change the influence back to 100%. Finally, just press E and then S to scale one final loop down. I'm pretty happy with the shape of the cut now and I'm going to add a loop which will mark the beginning of the curvature over the lip. So if I just press Ctrl R and add a loop here which circles the cut completely, after I left click to confirm the loop I need to press E on the keyboard to make sure that the loop is an even distance from one of the edges all the way around the edge of the cut. We're finished with the cast modifier now and it's got to be applied otherwise we can't do the rest of the modeling as this modifier would constantly be trying to force our mesh to be the same shape as our target shape. I normally delete the subdivision surface modifier first and change the subdivision levels here to 2. Press Ctrl and A while hovering over it in the modifier panel to apply it. Press Ctrl and 3 to add the subdivision surface modifier back. Now press Tab to go back to edit mode and we can start filling in the cut in a way which gives us excellent control over the curvature. Now just like we did earlier, select two opposing vertices at uh, one of the corners of the cut and move the cursor between them with Shift and S cursor to selected. Change the transform pivot back to 3D cursor. Again, select all of the other vertices between these two, but this time press E to extrude. And then immediately press S to scale this new extrusion down. You can just type 0.7 to move them uh, this distance down towards the 3D cursor. Repeat this process for the other side of the cut. Select the two corner vertices. Move the 3D cursor between them. Select the other vertices in between these two. Press E, then S and then type 0.7 and hit enter to scale these new edges in. Now it's time to make use of the excellent F2 add-on to fill in some faces. Just select one of the very corner vertices here, press F and then immediately right click to confirm this new face. Perfect. Now for the other face we need to select the edge rather than the vertex so that it connects properly to both sides around it. So select this and again press F and that's it, those two faces have been created correctly. Let's spin around to the other side of the model and repeat those steps for the other side. Select a corner vertex, press F and right click. Now select this last edge, press F and we have a good edge inside of our cut. Now we want the curve over the lip of our cut to be consistent all the way around and to do this we need to make a control loop which is an equal distance from the edge all the way around the inside. Just press Ctrl and R to add a loop on the inside of the cut here and uh, after you left click to confirm it you want to press E to make it an even distance from the outer edge. Again, it'll have a red dot on one of the edges and if it's not on the outer one, just press F to flip it to the right side and then left click to confirm. Now we can delete all these uneven and unwanted faces right on the inside by going to face select mode and then alt clicking on one of the edges between them. This selects the entire ring of faces that we don't want and pressing X and selecting faces gets rid of them. Everything is even and correct now so we can fill in the middle section very neatly. Again, the F2 add-on will come to our rescue and we can just select two opposing edges along the bottom and press F to fill them in with a long single face. Select one of the exposed edges of this new face and press F repeatedly until all of the side is filled in. But if we look in here at the very last face it added, we'll see that it's a triangle and we don't like triangles so we'll get rid of that in a moment. First of all, go back and select the other exposed edge inside the cut and again, just press F until it's all filled in. And if we look here, another triangle, which is actually just what we need. Whenever you have two triangles in a mesh, you can connect all the polygons between them and they'll turn into quads. So, press Ctrl and R and position this new loop in the middle of the cut. 
Left click to confirm it and then right click to keep it in the middle and we'll see that those two triangles have been converted to quads. Perfect. That's the cup modelled but now we need to be able to control it. So if we just press Ctrl and R and add our loop in between these two and then after we confirm that loop we can just uh, right click and choose Mark Seam from the right click menu. We know that this red loop can be alt clicked and moved just by pressing GG at any time to control the softness of our edge curve and that's really good. Okay, so that's all looking really good. Now we can move up to the top and think about creating the, the small detail at the top, which we'll do by selecting this vertice and deleting it. And after changing the transform center to median point, we can press E to extrude this loop in, and then press Z to move it up, and then we can continue just to create a, a simple shape at the top. When we get to the end, we uh, press Grid Fill, and uh, then perhaps we can take this point here and just move it up. And that's great, that's the detail done. You can uh, mess around with it and, and change anything you want as you go, uh, but I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. So let's uh, move on, and now we can move down and start extruding out the body of the bishop, which is a fairly trivial task, just the same way we did for the pawn, really, uh, following the reference and extruding everything down. Now Alt and click to select the last loop around the hole, and uh, in the front view, extrude that down, and this time it's at a slight angle, so we want to scale it along the z-axis to be zero before we start extruding everything else out. And then we can simply follow the mesh down, uh, extruding everything as we go. Loops can be added and adjusted. And I'm just gonna kind of vaguely follow this reference, which seems to be slightly off center. And don't forget that the bottom two loops have to be only translated, and the very last two loops have to be only scaled. Then we can orbit around and have a look and we can use a face grid fill to fill these in. And you may need to adjust the spans and the offset just to make sure everything is, is quads and rotated to match the axis. You can tweak away at it all, but uh, I'm pretty happy with everything. So I'm just gonna change the scale of the whole object as we've done before by changing the Z dimension. I'll just make it seven centimeters and then copy the Z scale into both the X and the Y scale. Now let's quickly tab back into edit mode select the very bottom vertex at the center of the mesh here, uh, move the 3D cursor to it by pressing Shift and S and selecting cursor to selected. Tab to object mode, right click and choose set origin, origin to 3D cursor. Now set all the position values here to zero, press Ctrl and A in the 3D view and choose all transforms. And that's the bishop done. It's made from all quads, it's two manifold, watertight, it's at a sensible resolution. We've got excellent control over all of our curvature. It's a pretty good job. Save this scene and we can move on to our next piece, the Rook. It's another one that everyone gets wrong because uh, extruding polygons outside of prototyping things is generally a bad idea. And that's how everyone seems to do it. There is a better way.